So I don't know why I was thinking about this. I think it was, I was, I was hanging out a little bit uh, with my family. I saw my nieces and, and they're all in elementary school, pretty much all of them. And uh, I was thinking about report cards and just, <laughs> I kind of live in the school system here at the University of Minnesota Duluth. We don't have report cards as much, but I was thinking back to my nieces and how elementary school report cards not only had grades, if, I don't know if you guys had this, but our elementary school report cards had our grades like here in reading and history and science and math, all those things. But we also had kind of like behavior report cards. And so, did you guys have that at all? Was that, okay, that's kind of a thing. Okay, good. I was like some weird and brainerd. Um, but it was I, a couple things. I remember there were two, two kind of assessment areas in behavior that I remember be, really wanting to do well in. And one was, uh, you know, it was the student, whoever it was, um, their ability to focus. And there was like, you had like a, we had an O outstanding, S satisfactory, U unsatisfactory was kind of a thing. So the ability to focus was one. I always wanted to be outstanding in that. But there's also kind of the opposite because I really wanted, I don't know, I wanted to do well in a lot of things. But, but I think there was something about like just, no, because I want to have the ability to focus. One of the things we realize is focusing is an ability. It's something you actually can grow in. It's like a, it's like a, it's a skill. But the opposite of this ability to focus was... Uh, <laughs> is, I remember it so clearly, on the back of the report card, um, is often a distraction to others. <laughs> and that was one that, one year, I remember one year one of my teachers put, like, yes, that was that Mike is a, often a distraction to others. And I remember thinking like, well, I'm Mike S, there was also Mike L. Mike L was a bigger distraction to others. I wasn't the biggest distraction in that class. But I remember thinking like, I don't wanna be a distraction because I really valued this idea, this reality, this ability to focus. And like, I don't wanna be the person who distracts other people unless I made them laugh, which was totally worthwhile. But the reality of course is in our lives, if we're gonna do well, we have to have the ability to focus. And again, focusing is an ability. It's something that we can grow in. It's something we can develop. And if we're gonna do well in life through focus, we have to be aware of the enemy. And the enemy of focus is distraction. And the reality, of course, I don't need to tell any of you, we already know this, we are surrounded by distractions. In fact, um, that's one of the reasons why distractions are so sneaky, is because anything can be a distraction. In fact, that, that's kind of what a di the definition of a distraction is. A distraction is anything that takes our focus away from where our focus belongs, right? A distraction is anything that takes our attention away from where it should be. A distraction is anything that takes us away from where we should be. And so, we, yes, your distraction might be your phone or it could be social media or it could be uh, the latest show or it could even be like a really good book that you all, pe all people are hanging out in your house but you're like standing in the stairwell of your house reading this book because you're so distracted by this thing. All, just, those can be distractions but also a distraction could be something like doing the dishes. A distraction could be something like vacuuming the floor. If doing the dishes is not the task you're supposed to be doing in this moment, if vacuuming the floor is not what you're supposed to be doing at this moment. So distractions are all around us. And distraction can be anything. And so we need focus. We need to be able to pay attention to the things that need our attention. We realize, of course, that at the same time, that while focus is really important, focus isn't the goal. Like attention isn't the goal. It's one of the things we need to reach the goal. And so I thought we'd say it like this, in order to identify distractions, the, all those things that take us away from where we should be, I need to know where I should be. <laughs> in order to identify distractions, which is anything that takes my attention away from where it should be, I need to know where should my attention be. I, this, is, this is why this whole process is not so much a distraction issue as much as it is a decision issue. Because I have to decide what's the goal. And not just what's, what's the goal for productivity, or what's the goal in school, or what's the goal in my goals for life, but what's the goal of life? In fact, you know, the, that, I love the gospel today, Matthew chapter 14. It's just remarkable because you can see, like, this is the life of a disciple. Like, this is actually in this one story we have of Jesus walking on water and him calling Peter onto the water. This is what it is in just this microcosm of what it is to be a disciple. Here's Jesus who is revealing himself, right? Jesus is, by walking on the water, we have to understand, by walking on the water, Jesus is, re is revealing his identity. He's revealing that he is divine. He's revealing his, his, the fact that he's God. And here are a boat full of, here's a boat full of disciples. Now remember, remember, a disciple, Jeff Gavin talks about this all the time, a disciple is not someone, simply someone who learns from his rabbi. There's more to that. A disciple is someone who lives like his rabbi. And so I, I look at the story and I, <laughs> I go back over it and say, here's Jesus walking on, the, walking on the water. They cry out, it's a ghost. And Jesus says, be, be, 
be, do, not, be not, do not be afraid, it's take courage, it's I. And Peter's response is, Lord, if it is you, tell, command me to come to you on the water, which I think is ridiculous. I think that's just like, who in the world would ever say that? Well, a disciple would say that. Here's Peter, who's been living with Jesus all this time and following Jesus as a disciple, following his rabbi. And remember, a disciple is not someone who simply learns from his rabbi. A disciple is someone who lives like his rabbi. So it makes sense that here is Peter. I'm a disciple. Jesus, my rabbi, is walking on the water. So if it is you, if this, is, if this whole thing is real, that a, a disciple learns how to live like his rabbi, then command me to do what you do. It's remarkable, but that's what it is to be a disciple, is to be able to do what the rabbi does. And so there's this massive moment where, where Jesus says, okay, come. And I just, I, I, I wonder, I wonder, I, I want to someday be able to actually, I don't know, if in, in heaven, if we can see all of time at, at one moment and be able to see what was that scene like where Peter, you know, throws his legs over the side of the boat and he begins walking on this water because it's incredible. This is the supernatural life. This is the, again, this is the life, it's a microcosm, a snapshot of what the life of every disciple should look like. Because all Christians are called to this. Not necessarily walking on water, but here, here's the, the supernatural life. So what do I mean by supernatural life? We all have the natural life. And the natural life are all the gifts that you and I have been given. So all of your strength, all of your intelligence, all of your humor, all the talents you developed over the course of your life, to, to live that way is awesome. So you have a doctor who has taken time to learn how the body works so that when that doctor encounters a body that's sick or hurt or injured or damaged, they know what to do. Or a teacher who's, who's studied Here's how people learn. And so when they encounter their students struggling with a concept, they know how to use their talents, natural life, to communicate wisdom and knowledge to their students. Or an auto mechanic who has spent time, a lot of time, working on cars so that when, here's, I, I, I know of mechanics who have just, they would hear the engine say, oh, this is the problem. Those are all incredible things. Those are natural gifts. Those are natural talents. Talents. That's natural wisdom. Those are good. But Jesus is calling us as disciples, not merely to develop our natural gifts, but to live the supernatural life. I mean, just to, to realize, Peter's doing something impossible. The moment he steps out of the boat, you know, Jesus wasn't just calling him. I mean, you can imagine if Jesus is calling someone to, hey, jump off a boat into a, a storm, a stormy, stormy sea, and just like, Swim. Just show, how, show me how courageous you are. Show me how much faith you have that I'm going to take care of you if you jump into the, into the storm. That would be amazing. That'd be great. And, but you could do, anyone could do that. Like literally anyone could do that if they have enough courage, if they have enough kind of boldness, they have enough trust in Jesus. But Jesus didn't ask Peter. He didn't command Peter to jump into the storm. He commanded Peter to do what he was doing. It is impossible to walk on water. And this is the life of faith. This is the life of grace. This is the life of a disciple. We are asked to do what we cannot do on our own natural power. And, and people do this. Peter did this. <laughs> he did this impossible thing and it, he had his eyes fixed on Jesus. He had his attention on Jesus. He had his focus on Jesus. And then what happened? There were wind. There was wind, there were waves, and Peter got distracted. Remember, the, the goal of a Christian is Jesus. Jesus is the goal. And wind and waves became a distraction. And when Peter took his eyes off of what he should, be fo should have been focused, where he took his attention away from where his attention belonged, he began to sink. You know, there, there's, it's so interesting. Where we focus will determine how we live. There's a story of uh, a man named Warren Buffett. You probably know who Warren Buffett is. He's this brilliant genius investor, you know, kind of a guy in, in America, United States. And at one point there's this old this story about how Warren Buffett had a pilot named Mike Flint. And um, he really respected Mike. He said he thought Mike Flint was a great pilot, but he also said he respected him so much that he said, you shouldn't be my pilot for the rest of your career. You must have goals. And Mike Flint said, I do have goals. And he said, well, you'd like me to coach you on, on what to do with those goals. And Mike Flint's like, yeah, I would take your advice. So he, Warren Buffett said, okay, Mike, I want you to sit down, take some time and write down what are your top 25 career goals? And so Mike Flint did this. He, and he actually took some time. It wasn't just kind of like off the top of his head. Um, it was, he took time and wrote down, what are the most important goals I have 
for the rest of my career, 25 of them. And he brought them to Warren Buffett and he said, okay, Warren Buffett said, okay, I want you to circle the top five. What are, out of that 25, what are the, your top five? And so again, Mike went back and, he, and these were very, very important goals to him. So it was hard work, but he narrowed it down. These are the top five and there's the other 20. So the top five were list A and the other 20 were list B. And Warren Buffett said, okay, you have your top five and you have your 20. What are you going to do about those, t- uh, what are you going to do about those 20? And Mike said, well, like what any of us would say, he said, well, I, I, you know, I'm going to focus on the five because they're really, really important. But these other 20 are very important too. So I think in my free time, you know, I'll kind of like work on them intermittently. And Warren Buffett said, no, that is what you must not do. Because, you know, you've identified your top five. These other 20, this is this list, this list you have to refer to as your avoid at all costs list that you can't do anything with these other 20 until these five are accomplished. Because we recognize, we recognize that if there's a goal that's worth your life, then we need to learn how to focus on that goal, which means we need to learn how to ignore all of the things that would distract us from focusing on that goal of our life. In fact, there's a guy named James Clear. James Clear, he said, focus can only occur when we've said yes to one option and no to all other options that Peter was called on the water as a disciple to focus on Jesus. That when he saw the wind and he saw the waves, he was distracted. And anything, distraction is anything that takes our attention away from what it should be. So the question is, what do we do? What do we do with this? Well, I would say there's four simple steps or four simple reminders. Really, really simple. The first is, remember, we need to decide. This is not as much a distraction issue as it is a decision issue. This is primarily a decision issue. So we have to decide. What or who gets your heart? What or who gets your focus? What or who gets your attention? And for the Christian, of course, the decision to place God at the center is to focus on Jesus. You know, uh, Tim Ferriss is also a, an author and a podcaster and a speaker. And he said this, he said, he said, what you don't do determines what you can do. What you don't do determines what you can do. We need to decide. And this is even in our daily tasks. Like, to be able to decide, okay, this is all for the Lord. Therefore, this moment is God's will for me. Whatever I'm doing, okay, this is, I'm doing this. This is God's will for me at this moment. So first thing I need to do is I need to decide what or who gets my focus. What or who gets my attention? What or who gets my heart? And the second thing is, again, these are super, super simple. So first, decide. Second is action. You know, the last two syllables of the word distraction is the word action. And so I decide, and then what I need to do is I need to attend to the task at hand. This is, this is so important for us. And I just basically, another way to say it is, wherever you are, be there. Whatever you're doing, do that. Whatever you're meant to, wherever you decided to focus on, focus on it. Essentially, be where your feet are. And that means something obvious, like if you're in prayer, obviously, pray. That's, that's the the intention of the moment. That's the purpose of this moment. That's what I'm going to do in this moment. But also, when you're with your kids, be there. When you're with your spouse, be there. And it doesn't have to be for the next hour, for the next 12 minutes, or 12 days. It could mean just, oh, in this moment, this is, you know, focus isn't something permanent. It's simply being present. It's not, it's not a permanent yes to everything. It is a present yes to this thing. That here's, there's, here's someone you, you're called in this moment to talk with, your coworker. Okay, be there. Or maybe it is actually a task. And like, this is the task. This is God's will for me at this moment. And so that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to give my focus. Maybe the task at hand is to rest. Say, so, okay, then I'm, gonna re- I'm going to actually rest. If I've decided that in this moment, what I'm supposed to be doing is resting, then act on that and actually rest. The third is to notice. So I decide, I act, and then notice. Basically, the distractions are going to come. They're going to come from exterior. Most distractions will be internal. And so the great thing about distractions is they reveal something to us. Notice, what are my distractions telling me? Notice, what are your distractions telling you? Because So there's this there's a psychological principle. It's an exercise called non-judgmental observation. 
So basically, you know, so often times when we, when we have a behavior that we identify as like, well, that's not good or that's not helpful, maybe it's something like distraction, we kind of shut ourselves down, maybe kind of even blame, accuse ourselves, we condemn ourselves. And not judgmental observation is just like, no, 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 don't condemn yourself, just notice. I'm being distracted. Okay, what are my distractions telling me? Because most often our distractions reveal what we love most, trust most, or fear the most. Our distractions often reveal those things, what I love the most, what I trust the most, or what I fear the most. So in the midst of that distraction, I'm gonna notice this and say, okay, what is happening here? Like, what am I running from? What am I looking for? So simply notice. So I decide, I act, notice the distraction. And then fourthly, all throughout this, (laughs) all throughout this whole thing, just listen. In order to listen, there needs to be silence. Not always silence, but there need to be times of like creating a space, a time where there is just listening, where there's just silence so that I can hear God's voice. I mean, the first reading today, here's the prophet Elijah. And God says, I'm going to speak to you. And so Elijah is on the side of the mountain. And he knows God is going to speak to him. What happens? Well, there, there's an earthquake, there's a storm, there's fire. But God wasn't in the earthquake, God wasn't in the fire, God wasn't in the storm. But Elijah listened in the silence. And then there was that still, small voice. We, if we're going to hear the voice of God, if we're going to hear what God is trying to say to us, we have to be willing to embrace the silence. To embrace silence is to prepare for holiness. It's necessary. And it is just so simple, but also so intimidating. And that's why we have to go back to deciding. I have to decide to enter into the silence. And I have to act and enter into silence. And I have to notice what are the distractions that come up in my silence. So these four simple steps are the last thing. These four simple steps to decide, to act, to notice, and to listen are necessary for the disciple. Because why? Because Jesus is calling us all to that supernatural life. Jesus is calling all of us at some point to step out of the boat. At some point in our lives, in our ordinary daily lives, Jesus is calling us to live extraordinary supernatural lives. So we have to be willing to decide. He is my goal. So I'm going to focus, to act and actually give him that focus, to notice and to listen. To be able to grow in our ability to focus, even in the midst of wind and waves and distractions.